a whiskey barrel, a master class on war, a baptism in the river, and Judas on fire. All in this episode of What the F Does This Even Mean? Blood Meridian. Welcome to What the F Does This Even Mean? Blood Meridian. I'm your host, Amy, from Amy Gets Lit. This is the sixth episode in my series on Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. In the last video, I talked about chapters 13, 14, and 15. This video, we will be covering chapters 16, 17, 18, and 19. I will be giving an overview of each chapter as our journey with the kid, the judge, and Glanton's gang moves from Mexico to Tucson, and we'll be highlighting and discussing parts that I find significant or interesting. In our last video, we saw the fate of Glanton's gang change. They lost their contract with Chihuahua City and a contract was put on Glanton's head. They traveled around, raising hell and taking lives in every village they traveled to. They became the hunted, pursued both by the Apaches and soldiers from the Mexican army. Now, our story continues. It was colder yet in the morning when they rode out. There was no one in the streets and there were no tracks in the new snow. At the edge of town, they saw where wolves had crossed the road. With this opening paragraph, I believe that McCarthy is setting the tone about where Glanton's gang finds themselves. It's cold and miserable. They're alone. They're being hunted. The wolves who have pursued them through this whole book even cross the street to avoid them. They ride the next day past the ruins of an old hacienda in San Bernardino. They are charged by bulls that were so old, the brandings on them were from the Spanish. They ride some more. Their scouts still have not returned. They ride and see a church in the distance. The judge and three others ride off to have a look. Glanton and the company keep moving forward, but turn back to meet up with the judge at the church. It's almost as if Glanton had second thoughts of the judge being left on his own. In the church, they come across two men that had lived there for years. They shot one, of course. The other spoke with the judge in German. The judge believes the man that they killed was an imbecile and the living man had lost his, ma his sanity living in the church. Glanton said that they should have killed the man that had gone mad, saying that he hated seeing a white man in that state. What's interesting to me here is that Glanton is almost offended by the man's mental state, but Glanton's a little bit mad himself. The gang head out and ride some more. In a gruesome scene, they find their scouts dead and mutilated, hanging from a tree, and some of the men cut them down. The two darker forms were the last of the Delawares, and the other two were the Vandeman Lander and a man from the east named Gilchrist. Among their barbarous hosts, they had met with neither favor nor discrimination, but had suffered and died impartially. As they ride past a Catholic mission, a pale green meteor comes from behind them and passes over them. Remember the meteor shower from page one? As the gang approaches Tucson, they come across a group of 100 Apaches. A group of 20 or 25 ride out to meet them. The leader asks where they're going, but before Glanton can answer, his horse attacks the leader's horse and bites his ear. Have the horses become so accustomed to violence that they behave violently? That's an interesting thought. The judge, with his silver tongue, smooths things over. The Apaches tell them to get them a barrel of whiskey and all will be forgotten. The gang rides into Tucson where they meet Lieutenant Kautz. Kautz returned to town four days ago to find it overtaken by Apaches who had been raising a little hell and drinking a lot of whiskey. Kautz greets Glanton formally as captain and Glanton asks where in this puke hole a guy can get a drink. It was the first word any of them had spoken. Couts looked them over, haggard and haunted and blacked by the sun. The lines and pores of their skin deeply grimed with gum black where they'd washed the bores of their weapons. Even the horses looked alien to any he'd ever seen, decked as they were in human hair and teeth and skin. Save for their guns and buckles and a few pieces of metal in the harness of the animals, there was nothing about these arrivals to suggest even the discovery of the wheel. Lieutenant Couch tells them there are plenty of places, but all of them are closed, and Glanton says that they'll see about that. They saunter into a bar, and the owner serves them their drinks in his tidy whities While the gang is drinking, Glanton and the judge walk the streets trying to recruit new members to come out to California with them. They meet Cloyce Bell, who is willing to pay to go there with them, but he has to take his imbecile brother with him. His brother is kept in a cage away from the rest of the townspeople. Bell charges people money to see his brother as a wild man sideshow. This is another example of how everyone in this book uses someone else for their own gain. Bell treats his brother terribly and profits from it. 
Later on, the Americans want some grub, so they go into a restaurant owned by a man named Owens. Owen comes to the table and tells them that he has no problem serving people of color, but they'd have to move tables. You can imagine how much this irks Glanton, a man that has made his prejudice pretty known to be thought of as a person of color. Glanton begins arguing with Owens and Owens points to Black Jackson, who we haven't heard anything of in this book for some time, and says he knows for a fact that he is not white. David Brown gives Owens a gun and tells him to shoot Black Jackson. Black Jackson rises and shoots Owens before Owens can do anything. David Brown tells his brother Charlie to get them some plates. In a Katina, Lieutenant Kaut approaches Glanton and tells him that he needs to know who killed Owens and that he has to take that man in. Glanton denies it was any of his men and the judge takes it one step further and denies even eating there. This makes Lieutenant Kaut angry and he leaves with his men. Bell decides that he and his brother will go with Glanton's gang. He shares a story of him and his brother and their fate with Glanton and the judge. The judge, ever curious, listens intently and then begins to study Bell's head. He explores the contours of his head with his hands like a faith healer. He prods along the back of his skull. This, of course, is more of the judge wanting to learn things and understand. But it's more than that, too. Feeling his forehead? That's a callback to the art of phrenology. Phrenology is a pseudoscience that deals with the shape of the head being a predictor of character and mental abilities. He's able to compare the skull of the idiot with the skull of the seemingly typical brother. Lieutenant Kautz comes back again. He knows that one of Glanton's men killed Owens, and he wants someone to answer for the crime. The judge sits him down and explains the law to him, citing Latin terms of jurisprudence and well-known men of law. Lieutenant Counts is upset. Like I said, he knows one of Glanton's men killed Owens. He just doesn't have the evidence to prove it. The next morning, it is discovered that a young Mexican girl has been abducted. They found torn and bloody clothes and drag marks in the desert and a shoe. Again, where Judge Holden exists, children seem to disappear. The interesting thing, though, is we are never witness to Holden's crimes. We're witness to the violence the gang hands out. We're witness to their bad behavior. We are never witness to Holden's crimes, though. The gang continued the bad behavior they exhibited in the Mexican villages in Tucson. They steal a barrel of whiskey to give to the Apaches they met outside of town. The next day, as they're getting ready to leave town, the judge wagers that he can lift a large anvil that was made from a meteorite. Once he accomplishes this, he bets he can lift it over his head. He does. Then he bets that he can throw it 10 feet. He throws it 11. Chapter 17 is a very, very important chapter. It is also one of the few chapters in which Glanton's gang does not deal out any sort of violence. I find this significant, considering the tone, theme, and contents of this chapter. They rode out at dusk. The corporal in the gatehouse above the portal came out and called to them to halt, but they did not. They rode 21 men and a dog in a little flatbed cart aboard which the idiot in his cage had been lashed as if for a sea journey. The gang ran out with the barrel of whiskey they stole to deliver it to the Apaches. They have drained the barrel and refashioned it. They attached a three-quart flask of whiskey inside to the hole of the barrel and filled the rest of the barrel with water. Mangus and some Apaches ride out to meet the gang, and the whiskey is exchanged for gold and silver. Glanton's gang cannot help but take advantage of people when the opportunity rises. They ride on, and they camp. That night, Glanton stared long into the embers of the fire. All about him, his men were sleeping, but much was changed. So many gone, defected or dead. The Delawares all slain. He watched the fire, and if he saw portents there, it was much the same to him. He would live to look upon the western sea and he was equal to whatever might follow for he was complete at every hour. Whether his history should run concomitant with men and nations, whether it should cease. He long forsworn all weighing of consequences and allowing as he did that men's destinies are given yet he usurped to contain within him all that he would ever be in the world and all the world would be to him and be his charter written in the earth stones itself, he claimed agency and said so, and he drive the remorseless sun onto its final endarkment as if he'd ordered it all ages since, before there were paths anywhere, before there were men or sons to go upon them. This is our first glance at Glanton having any kind of introspection. I think this passage demonstrates just how much power he gives the idea of fate. 
We saw this a little bit earlier in the scene with the magician's family telling fortunes around the fire. Here we have almost a breathing sigh of relief that he is indeed going to make it to the Western Sea. We also see that Glanton doesn't consider his consequences, and even though he knows he cannot escape his fate, he does his damnedest to outrun it. The metaphor here regarding the sun tells us his desire to control his fate, even though he knows he can't escape it. And that desire to control it leads him to do some pretty messed up things. While Glanton is contemplating by the fire, the judge is watching the man in the cage and scribbling in his ledger. Two days later, they come across a group of Sonora troops led by a man named Colonel Garcia. They were hunting a group of Apaches led by a man named Pablo. Remember that it was Elias and his soldiers on the orders of the Sonora government that chased and pursued and killed Glanton and his gang in the desert before he reached the United States. Glanton shows this man no emotion, no reaction. History keeps repeating itself in this novel. Instead of recognizing that, instead of learning from it, Glanton lives entirely in the moment. That's all that he exists. That's where he exists. Much like their time in Mexico, they ride in camp, they ride in camp some more. One night around the fire, someone asked Tobin if it was true that there were once two moons in the sky. Never one to miss a beat, Tobin says it could very well have been true, but God reached down and squeezed it with his thumb, making the second moon extinct because of the lunacy among men caused by two moons. Tobin said God would have gotten rid of the other moon, but he needed to make sure the birds could see to fly at night. We've all heard people talk about the moon making people crazy. We hear it even now. These thoughts were especially prevalent before we had the science we do now to understand neurology, pathology, and human behavior. They ask him about life on Mars as Judge Holden approaches after doing Judge Holden things. The judge says that this is nonsense. And in Judge Holden fashion, he holds a lecture for the guys on the way things are. The universe is no narrow thing and the other within it is not constrained by any latitude in its conception to repeat what exists in one part in any other part. Even in this world, more things exist without our knowledge than with it, and the order in creation which you see is that which you put there, like a string in a maze, so that you shall not lose your way. For existence has its own order, and that no man's mind can compass, that mind itself being but a fact among others. The judge acknowledges here that despite his desperation to know everything, he will never know it all, ever. It reminds me of the quote by Socrates, the more I know, the more I realize I know nothing. More conversation takes place at the fire. I'll save it for you to discover, but the exchange between the judge and Davy Brown is really fascinating. The gang continues their journey and travel past change, pack saddles, dead mules, and ruined wagons. They pass an Apache that had been crucified and dried in the sun. They camp again and Judge Holden presents a lecture, again, this time on the subject of war. He turned to Brown from whom he'd heard some whispered slur or demur. Ah, Davy, he said, it's your own trade we honor here. Why not rather take a small bow? Let each acknowledge each. My trade? Certainly. What is my trade? War. War is your trade, is it not? And it ain't yours? Mine too, very much so. What about all them notebooks and bones and stuff? All of their trades are contained in that of war. Is that why war endures? No, it endures because young men love it and old men love it in them. Those that fought, those that did not. This whole scene is very, very important. I'm not including everything here, but what I feel are the most important parts in what Judge is saying and how I interpret them. The judge smiled. Men are born for games, nothing else. Every child knows that play is nobler than work. He knows, too, that the worth or merit of a game is not inherent in the game itself, but rather the value of which is put at hazard. Games of chance require a wager to have meaning at all. Games of sport involve the skill and strength of the opponent and the humiliation of defeat and the pride of victory are in themselves sufficient stake because they inhere in the worth of the principles and define them. But trial of chance or trial of worth, all games aspire to the condition of war. For here, that which is wagered swallows up game, player, all. Might does not make right, said Irving. The man that wins in some combat is not vindicated morally. 
Moral law is an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement of the powerful in favor of the weak. Historical law subverts it at every turn. A moral view can never be proven right or wrong by any ultimate test. A man falling dead in a duel is not thought thereby to be proven in errors as to his views. His very involvement in such a trial gives evidence of a new and broader view. Okay, so I have a lot of thoughts here. While the other men may have difficulty admitting that what they've been doing is participating in acts of war, the judge acknowledges this and admits to it. It is the highest stakes and contains all trades. The judge then goes on to discuss how war exists in all men, the young and the old, as if war is born in man. Now, I wonder, could this play into the first page where the narrator tells us that the, the kid, who was then the child, already broods a taste of mindless violence inside of him? Was this line specific to the kid, or was this a general statement about the nature of man? Let's look at the kid's actions and his behaviors. We start out reading this book with the idea that a taste for mindless violence exists within the kid. Throughout the book, however, we see him not participate in violence unless he's cornered at first. Then we see him offering mercies and kindness to those both in Captain White's filibuster and Glanton's gang. Throughout the book, we see the judge study the kid. We know that the judge takes time to study things he doesn't understand. He doesn't study anyone else within Glanton's group in the same way. I think maybe it's something to consider. When Judge Holden says that war is the ultimate game, this reminds me of childhood games. I'm not sure if this is so commonplace now. Keep in mind I am in my 40s. But I remember playing with the neighborhood boys and it was always games where there was a good guy and there was a bad guy and both groups were trying to take each other out with fake cat guns that look like pistols or squirt guns or water balloons. If you take that squirt gun away, kids make gun shapes with their hands. And really, it's not just kids. We see it in video games. Hell, we even see it in things like paintball. Don't get me wrong. I am not criticizing these things in any way. I'm just saying that we see this. We see this. We see this. It also makes me wonder though, does this war extend beyond violence? Look at our societal and cultural climate right now. There is always a grouping of versus teams or sides, and someone is launching threats of violence, name calling, or intellectually dishonest ideas at each other. And that is just adults talking about current events. Even trolling could potentially be looked upon it through this lens. Just some things to think about here. The judge makes some great points here, war endures. It doesn't end. History is full of examples of this, even in our modern history. War has always been and war will always be. War is inevitable. War is God. And quite frankly, that's what you're doing in war. You're playing God. I have a lot of thoughts here on what the judge says about morality being created by the weak to harm the strong. I can't help but relate this to our current political climates and how groups in power with structural and socioeconomic privilege globally demonize groups without the power and privilege they hold and behave according to the idea that they are victims, that their identity or lifestyle or other things they enjoy are under an imagined threat. Their behavior through fear, spreading misinformation, creating propaganda are all parts of this sort of mentality and it really manifests itself out of these same sort of ideals that the judge talks about here. This was written in the late 70s and into the early 80s. There were a lot of things going on socially at that time, politically at that time. It was published in 1984, before being woke was a thing. Reading this book in 2019, let me tell you, as much as this might make some fans of this book upset, McCarthy narrates a whole lot of wokeness in this book if you really take the time to think about what he's saying instead of focusing solely on the violence. That is what frustrates me most about this book being referred to as Dude Bro Lit. There are so many nuanced and intelligent thoughts within this text. To write it off as Dude Bro Lit does this book and McCarthy a huge, huge injustice. They travel and when they camp, the judge gives another lecture and holds another Q&A with the gang. This time the topic is paleontology. Three days later, they reach Colorado and come across a camp that has fallen to cholera. They see a ferry piloted by a doctor from New York named Lincoln. Glenn introduces himself and tells Lincoln he is at his service. You know that's not going to be good, right? 
Glanton, the judge, and five men ride downriver back to a camp, and they meet the Yumas. In the early morning, while still dark, Glanton, judge, and the five men from Glanton's gang ride out again. A plan was in place with the Yuma to commandeer the ferry. While they were gone, the sun rose, and a group of women at the ferry, the campground at the ferry, found the man in the cage. They were outraged by the treatment of this man and seek out his brother. She scolds Cloyce Bell for his treatment of his brother, and we find out that the man in the cage's name is James Robert Bell. Cloyce Bell tells the woman, whose name is Sarah, that she can have the man in the cage. He doesn't care. The women clean up the man in the river. While he's being cleaned in the river, his cage is being burned. They dress him in clothes, comb down his hair. In the middle of the night, the man from the cage wanders into the river and slips. The judge just happens to be strolling past naked, goes into the water, and saves him. He reunites the man in the cage with Glanton's gang. The doctor had been bound for California when the ferry fell into his hands for the most by chance. In the ensuing months, he'd amassed a considerable wealth in gold and silver and jewelry. He and the two men who worked for him had taken up residence on the west bank of the river, overlooking the ferry landing among the abutments of an unfinished hillside fortification made from mud and rock. Glatton, the judge, Doc Irvin, and one of the Browns sit down with Lincoln and have a little chat over tea. Glatton warns Lincoln that the Yuma could not be trusted and that he could probably use his help. Don't forget, Glatton has already schemed with the Yuma to take over the ferry. Lincoln says he's had no problem with the Yuma, but eventually agrees to Glatton's protection. Two days later, the attack that Glatton and the judge planned with the Yuma take place, except Glatton's gang turns their back on the Yuma and, with the help of a howitzer, shoot half of the Yuma down. The rest they pursue on horseback and continue their attack. They scalp the dead. At this point, this act is one that is gratuitous and pointless. They aren't being paid for scalps anymore. There was no point and no need to do this. After this, Glatton takes control of the ferry. With Glanton in charge, the ferry no longer costs a dollar to cross. He charges four. Then they just start taking everything owned by those wanting on the ferry instead. A company of U.S. soldiers from Kentucky that operated under the supervision of General Patterson refused to deal with Glanton and the gang, so they build their own ferry downriver. After the U.S. soldiers move on, the Yuma take over the ferry with the help of a man named Callahan. Within a few days, that ferry is set on fire and the body of Callahan floats in the river. Glanton cannot stand the idea of competition. He cannot stand the idea of people having choice, especially when others' choices will impact his finances. The only way he knows how to deal with this issue, though, is through brutality. Easter in that year fell on the last day of March, and at dawn on that day, the kid together with Toadvine and a boy named Billy Carr crossed the river to cut willow poles at a place where they grew upstream from the encampment of immigrants. Passing through this place before it was yet good light, they encountered a party of Sonorans up and about, and they saw hanging from a scaffold a poor Judas fashioned from straw and old rags who wore on his canvas face a painted skull that reflected in the hand that executed it no more than a child's conception of the man and his crime. Someone had brought a long cane from the fire tipped with lighted tow, and the Judas was being set afire. This is a blinking neon light biblical allusion here to Jesus and his betrayal at the hands of Judas. This is a chapter full of betrayals. This offers us some foreshadowing to events to come as well. By now, Glatton had enslaved a number of Sonorans and he kept crews of them working at the fortification of the hill. There were also detained in their camp a dozen or more Indian and Mexican girls, some little more than children. Glanton supervised with some interest the raising of the walls about him, but otherwise left his men to pursue the business at the crossing with terrible latitude. On April 2nd, Toadvine, David Brown, and Long Webster pack up and leave for San Diego on a supply run. They arrive five days later. While in San Diego, the wealth that the gang has obtained while operating the ferry is demonstrated while they're at the grocers. Their bags of money not have just a lot of coin, but coins from different places around the world. They go out to cause a little hell. David Brown wakes up not sure where Toadvine and Long Webster are. He finds out that they have been arrested. He talks to the local magistrate in an effort to obtain their release, but he is refused. He goes to a farrier and tells him he needs the barrel of a shotgun cut down. He's going to get his dudes out of jail. The farrier refuses because the gun is too nice. 
Brown chases him off by threatening him and starts to use the farrier's tools to do it himself. Toadvine and Webster are released from jail and find Brown in the town center. They go to the water and pass a bottle between them. None of them have ever seen the ocean before. They go into town and keep chugging the Brown stuff. They get into a bar fight and Brown pours booze over a soldier and lights him on fire with a cigar. It's his turn to spend some time in San Diego's jail. He bribes a soldier that is guarding him to free him. The soldier resists at first, but two days later he agrees. As they ride out of town, Brown shoots him in the head, takes the money he paid him off with, takes his ears for his necklace, and rides off again. In the meantime, Webster and Toadvine return empty-handed and tell Glanton that Brown has been arrested with all of their money. Glanton rounds up five men, leaves the judge in charge of the ferry, and sets off to get his money. And Brown, too. They set off to San Diego in the middle of the night and go directly into the magistrate's house where they threaten the lives of the magistrate and his wife. They also threaten the grocer. They tie all three up and abandon them in a hut on the edge of the ocean where they are found three days later. While the magistrate, his wife, and the grocer were bound and left with only a pan of water, Glanton and his boys spend two days and two nights drunk. Narrowly escaping imprisonment, Glanton returns alone to the ferry with his men traveling together to go check out some gold fields in California. Glanton returns to the ferry, drunk. A young Mexican girl was crouched naked under the shade of the wall. She watched him ride past, covering her breasts with her hands. She wore a rawhide collar about her neck and she was chained to a post and there was a clay bowl of blackened meat scraps beside her. Glanton tied the jacks to the post and he rode inside on the horse. There was no one about. He rode down to the landing. While he was watching the river, the doctor came scrambling down the bank and seized Glanton by the foot and began to plead with him in a senseless jabber. He would not seen to his person in weeks, and he was filthy and disheveled, and he tugged at Glanton's trouser leg and pointed toward the fortification on the hill. That man, he said, that man. You remember that Glanton left the judge in charge, right? Glanton slid his boot from the stirrup and pushed the doctor away with his foot and turned the horse and rode back up the hill. The judge was standing on the rise in silhouette against the evening like some great, bald, and archimandrite. He was wrapped in a mantle of free-flowing cloth beneath which he was naked. The judge seems to have taken to being in charge. When I picture this, I picture him looking like some giant baby-faced god of war. Chaos all around him and him gaining strength from all this chaos. The men start to behave and act like him as we see in how Jackson is dressed, almost as if Judge Holden is a cult leader. There are a couple of days of drink and debauchery. Someone gave the man from the cage some whiskey and he begins to dance. Remember what happened in past chapters when dancing began? Well, it happens here too. A few days later, Jackson is on the ferry. He bends down to pick up a coin on the floor and is hit by an arrow of the Yumas. The Yumas are invading. They first enter Lincoln's quarters and come out minutes later with his head. A few of Glanton's guys are killed as they make their way to Glanton's quarters. Inside, Glanton is asleep on a big brass bed he took from a migrating family. One of the Yumas jumps on the bed and splits the head of John Joel Glanton wide open with an axe. When they go to the judge's quarters, a girl of 12 years and the man from the cage are cowering, both naked. Also naked, but holding the howitzer and a lit cigar is the judge. The Yuma know if he lights it, they're all dead and they flee. The judge also flees, taking with him the man from the cage into the woods. This is one of the first times that we sort of become witness to Judge Holden's crimes. While we don't know what he's doing to the girl and the man from the cage, we know that something terrible is happening here and is at the hands of the judge. It is interesting that it's almost like the judge had anticipated this attack by the Yumas, taking the howitzer into his room, having his cigar lit, and ready to blow things up. The savages built a bonfire on the hill and fueled it with the furnishings from the white men's quarters, and they raised up Glatton's body and bore it aloft in the manner of a slain champion and hurled it onto the flames. And so ends chapter 19. Who lived? Who died? What became of the judge? And what the F does this all mean? Let me know what you thought about this video and my thoughts on what happens in the um, comment section down below. And guess what? You won't have to wait much longer to find out how this all ends because next week is our final video telling the story of the judge, the kid, and Glanton's gang. The video will be covering the final four chapters. 
20, 21, 22, and 23, and the short epilogue. Are you ready for this journey to come to an end? Now, the promo stuff. If you like this content, please remember to ring the bell so you're notified when I bring you something new. Like this video and subscribe. I will see you next week for our final video. Bye-bye.